Hi, I'm Alejandro Landes, the director of Monos. Hello and welcome to the 33rd Teddy Award. I'm Hannah Condon and I'm here with director Alejandro Landris to talk about his film Monos. Hi, it's lovely to have you here. Thank you. Uh, so, correct me if I'm wrong, but is, it, is the film loosely based on Lord of the Flies, the novel? Uh, or is that, just a, is that just a similarity that happens to have happened? Well, I think the film, um, it has the same allegorical power as Lord of the Flies, right? It it's a, comes out of a very specific conflict, which is Colombia Civil War, but grows out of it and becomes its own world, very much like Lord of the Flies. It's in the background of World War, but then it is bigger than that. Same thing with uh, Heart of Darkness from, from Conrad. And so, so I think in that allegorical sense, I think it's very similar. Yeah. yeah. I suppose in both of those examples, um, the characters are almost all men. Why did you want to introduce characters of different genders and sexualities? Because I think uh, warfare changes. Although war is part of who we are as a human species, warfare has changed a lot, and I think our generation lives war with not very clean cut lines. So it's not like the world war where you knew exactly where you stand. There's a certain fog of war. And now in war, women take a very active position. Uh, men take a very active position. And then also transgender and different, different people. So I don't think gender is important as in war as it used to be. There used to be a very kind of almost romantic front line, glorious notion of men in the front lines of war. This is a war in the back lines with um, where gender is as fluid as ideology. And I think in that fog of war, um, you don't have any binary setup. It's not about left or right, boy or girl. I think it's, it, there's something deeper than that. And I think the film is going into, into exactly that depth. And yeah. there are quite a few characters uh, in, in the film who are, it's yeah. not specified what their gender is. Um, and there's also same-sex attractions that's also not really spoken about. It's just a fact yeah. of the film. Um, I was wondering, though, if there was any implication that the reason that these characters are sort of on the outskirts in this almost like exile group was linked in any way to the sexuality or, or non-conforming genders. Because I think Dog at one point says, like I fucked the whole village and, and I wondered if maybe there was an idea that they were being shunned as a result of their behavior previously. Right. Well, I think they're all adolescents, they're all teenagers and I think that's a moment of great inner conflict because your body's changing, it's at once uh, beautiful and grotesque, you're desperately wanting to belong but also be alone and be your own thing. I think um, that you're looking for an identity and I think that that inner conflict of adolescence is kind of mirrors the exterior conflict in the film and so um, while you're looking and you're exploring I think you're there's, there's much more freedom and fluidity to that moment and I thought that that was what's so interesting the film doesn't try to reach any answers it's a film about a conversation about a process about um, you know us looking for a peace looking for an identity and um, and that can also be fluid, it's not just one thing. And so in the main character, in, um, in Rambo, 
half the audience lives the film with Rambo as a boy, the other half lives with Rambo as a girl. And I don't think that changes the deeper impressions of the film. Uh, in fact, during the casting process, we looked at over 800 kids from all over Colombia in different places. Getting all these tapes, looking at all these people, after looking at so many tapes, we became gender blind. Initially, Rambo in the screenplay um, was a boy, a very specific gender. But watching a tape of somebody play basketball with a bunch of boys being called Matt, and who I thought was a boy, even on tape, and then I saw was a girl, but I identified more with boys, that I rewrote um, the screenplay to create Rambo and that character because I think it's very important to let life onto the page instead of enforcing the page on life. Okay, yeah. that's really interesting then. So the, the actor influenced the way that you wrote the character. Exactly, afterwards. exactly. Because I think that the, the whole fluidity of gender went along with the, with the fluidity of um, um, the war and the ideology. A lot of times people are trying to look down on something and, and, and try to give it a name and say what it is. And sometimes when you're trying to give it a name, you kill it. You have to let it be, not label it. You know? And I think that that, that that search gives such freedom and allows things to, to develop in a much more interesting way. Uh, and I don't think the deeper impressions of the film change because the unit is a leftist or rightist or a boy or girl. I think it's, I think it's, it's deeper than that. It's more about a person than, uh, than a gender. Yeah, mm -hmm. and the film doesn't sort of talk in detail about the actual conflict that is set in. It's always quite mm -hmm. abstract, but you said it's influenced by Colombian civil war. Mm -hmm. uh, can you give me a bit more insight into the background and the, or maybe the, the real life influences that you had when writing the story? Yeah, Colombia's been immersed in a 60 year civil war, a war with many fronts. You have guerrillas, you have paramilitary, you have narcos, you have the state, you have foreign intervention. And even within those groups, you have mini groups. So there are no clear cut lines, like in World War I or World War II. There is something that's been broken down and that war has been going on for many, many, many decades now. And now there's a chance of peace, the first chance for my generation. The president was given the Nobel Peace Prize for signing an agreement with the main guerrilla group. And these people have let down their arms, put them down, and are coming into the cities for what is supposed to be a big reinsertion program. And the film narrates two big fears. The people that are putting down their arms and going to the cities and villages don't know whether they will be helped to start anew or they will wind up dead on the streets in act of revenge. And society doesn't exactly know how to receive them. And then another big fear is, yes, we signed an agreement with the heads of these guerrilla units, but what if they splinter off? What if there are small groups within these illegal armies that say, we want to continue fighting? or we like to be in this fringe and continue to wage war. And so the film travels to the heart of the fear that prohibits us from attaining a more stable and lasting peace. But I don't think the film is exactly about Colombia. I think um, it transcends the space because a lot of societies break down very quick, even in very developed countries, even here in Germany where we are, where society broke down very quickly not too long ago. And so I think that the film um, shows you that there's no conflict that is necessarily a foreign conflict. Yeah. And I suppose similarly linking the content of the film to real events, um, mm -hmm. the space that, even though it's a very kind of militaristic space um, that the kids exist in, does still seem to be this quite uh, liberal sexual um, space and, and you know there's transgender characters that mm -hmm seemingly aren't threatened as a result of that. Is that reflective of Colombian society at all, and particularly in a militaristic Colombian society? Well, it's interesting. Um, I, I believe that in the illegal armies in Colombia, they've actually been very restrictive. I don't think homosexuality is allowed, for example, in these illegal armies. On the other hand, they don't believe in more bourgeois conceptions of marriage, and you, but you do have to ask permission to partner with somebody to the higher command. You can't just partner with whoever you want. Um, and so actually in the illegal armies in Colombia, they do control your sexual life and it's surprising. And I think that this group, which is born out of the real idea that there's hostage taking all around the world as part of war, but in Colombia it's been very prevalent. And many times the cheapest way of taking care of a hostage is let's give them to the lowest rung of the ladder, the lowest level soldiers, leave them in a remote place until uh, um, ransom is paid or some political leverage is gained 
And so um, this is what happens, that many times those lowest level soldiers are kids and they leave them in some place. And I think, imagine the idea that you had when you were a teenager of I want to go to some far off place where no one tells me what to do with my friends. And there I think you're free to experiment, free to feel. And that doesn't only happen uh, with the kids in the film, but it also happens with their hostage who hasn't felt human warmth and human touch in a very long time and actually has an encounter with a little girl. A moment where fear and tenderness and a desire to feel affection is confused with sexuality and becomes something else. I was actually going to ask next yeah. about that particular scene yeah. because there's this real absence of authority, as you say, uh, and at times that does seem liberating. And at times it's sort of so liberating that actually there ends up being a bit of confusion. Yes. And, and in that particular scene, the girl seems to be confusing, or maybe they're both confusing affection for something sexual. And I suppose, did you come to any conclusions about how you can draw a line between sexual liberation and then a liberation that can then be abused? Yeah. I definitely don't think I've come to any conclusions. For me, a film is a process of exploration. It's a part of joining a conversation, a conversation about these gender issues, about peace, about who we are. Um, and it's interesting you would point that out because I think that in some level, we don't want anyone to curtail our freedom. But on the other hand, we do want some type of guidance or some type of understanding of who we are. And we're looking for some parameters because Freedom is a very tricky thing. On one hand, you want to have absolute freedom. On the other hand, um, I think even yourself, if granted that opportunity, you sometimes get lost with the excess of, uh, of choice. Um, that's something I think you see in behavior like economics and how we behave. Sometimes the excess, is, excess of choice is paralyzing. Um, but here I think it's really a, a process of, of kids at that moment of your life where you're really in a process of self-discovery. right? And similarly, on the lines of, of the lack of authority, mm. violence is, uh, kind of ensues seemingly as a result of that. Do you think that that is inevitable if there is a lack of authority that, that violence mm. will ensue? I think that you do need a certain level of structure. Um, I think that rules are in place for a certain reason. The problem is that those rules generally get abused and um, it's very tough to keep those in check. Um, so generally it has to be some checks and balances, but I think human beings <coughs> look for structure. And we see even, even within kids, kids look for structure in different ways, even very young ones. Um, so it's interesting, I think it's, it, there, there's no one answer. I think that that's why the film, it deals with tones of gray. There's no black and white there. Yeah. And there's the scene where Rambo is sort of rescued by this family. Yeah. And it seems like this very thin dividing line between this world of complete carnage almost, and then something that seems very civilized. And w what is the difference between those two worlds? What, what draws that very thin line? I think that's what the film asks. What is that thin line, that thin veneer between what is anarchy, what is civilization, what do we call democracy? These words that we all think are great civilization, democracy, freedom, but what is that? What is, the, what, what is the line? And I think that the film, at first you have these otherworldly landscapes that are ethereal and seem so far away and almost magical, but the film as it progresses comes closer, closer, closer to home, you start to see a house, a typical family structure, a television, and finally you see a city. And I think bringing these questions back home is what brings the, home, the film resonate with you. And it's not about some foreign conflict with some other people. It's really about us. And, and, and I think that this isn't a film about child soldiers as, in, as much as it is about you know, who we are and who we want to be. And I think that that's not the same as our uh, parents or our grandparents' generation. And that's why I think here the film, even when it addresses gender, it doesn't have a boy playing a girl or a girl playing a boy to have some big reveal at the end to try to say, oh, look, um, he actually has breasts. Or no, there isn't that, but act because it's almost like a post-gender thing where that doesn't change the, the impression of the film. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I also wanted to ask a little yeah. bit about the soundtrack. So you work yeah. with Mickey Levy, yes. uh, and the soundtrack seems to be quite a, a, plays a key role in kind of forming those dividing lines, so tipping something from seeming beautiful to seeming actually quite terrifying. Right. Uh, how did you go about discussing what kind of soundtrack you wanted? Yeah. Well, with Mika, I think we looked at something that was both minimal and monumental. Um, 
for budget and for aesthetic reasons. And also we had so many characters that Meek and I worked on making sure that the music had character. The, the environments change, but the music doesn't. And I'll give you an example of that. When the messenger appears or the organization that is lording over the kids, um, they, she designed a really and composed a beautiful shrill whistle that's very oppressive. And like Peter and the Wolf, it, the music and the characters are attached. So whenever the organization, the messenger appeared, you had a sound that really gave you that emotional cue. And so different characters had different sounds, uh, musical sounds, and that really made a, a very big difference, particularly when dealing with a pack, because there's a, the real protagonist of the film is this group, this mini society. And the cinematography as well is absolutely stunning. The, the, the locations are incredible. I was wondering, where, where did you actually film most of it? Well, we shot in, um, in this very unique area, which is a wetland plateau, 14,000 feet up in the air, um, in Colombia called Paramo, Paramo Chingasa. And that area actually, uh, underneath, the, underneath the grass there, is, are, are there big reservoirs of water in the... Um, in Colombia, and that water trickles down the mountain all the way down and rushes into those big jungle rivers you see in the end of the film. And the film actually follows those locations in its structure. We start at the mountain, then delve into the jungle, gaining more and more speed and stronger pace, uh, following water. And the film, we were trying to structure it like a river. It meanders, it ebbs and flows, it winds uh, between all these different characters and, and sort of shaping the film like water. And what was, what was it actually like filming in those locations? Because presumably quite sort of yeah, tough it conditions. <laughs> it was killer, it was killer. Uh, well, it, in the mountain, um, very little oxygen, wet. The weather changes in an instant. It was punishing. The mountain was punishing and then... <laughs> I can imagine. Yeah, it was punishing. And then the jungle, um, probably the only blessing that violence has had in Colombia is that there are some places that were so dangerous nobody went to, so they still remain unspoiled. And so we went to um, this river, this jungle canyon called the Samana River. And the river has gold, so there's some illegal gold prospectors. And we went down that river with, um, to down that canyon with a pack of mules with our gear and food. And then we had Colombia's rafting and kayaking team help us get to a base camp. And then uh, a family of gold miners came on board as production assistants. So we had <laughs> mules, kayak instructors, and um, and basically this family of gold miners as our production to be able to live in the jungle for a month. And it was a beautiful thing and it was probably the hardest thing I've ever done, but also uh, the most satisfying. Yeah, that's incredible. And yeah. was, was there any danger where you were uh, filming? Um, we felt pretty much at peace. We were some of the first people there. Um, I don't think anything had ever been made there. But we were taken care of. We were taken care of. We felt, we felt good. We were with the locals, the people that knew that river, the river people, that, that look for gold in that river. And, and it's, not, it's an illegal thing to do, but that's how they make their living, and they took care of us. And, and the river treated us well, but it was tough. I mean, I got taken out of there on a stretcher one day. And, really? How and, come? Uh, well, I woke up. I, I, I couldn't even move. Uh, they thought I had appendicitis, and there was a certain amount of hours to take me out before it exploded. So I remember um, I got carried out on a stretcher by this family of gold miners. They took me up the canyon um, and it was raining. And I remember crying, not because of the pain, but because I was thinking, how are we going to get an underwater photographer, Julianne Nicholson, all these kids, special effects people, these mining, these kayakers, the mules, all this. This, has been, this film is like aligning the stars. This won't happen again. So we need to make this film now. <laughs> and uh, fortunately, yeah, we need to make it. I mean, it, we worked hard, but at a certain level, there's a level of luck where the stars had to align to make this movie. And, and so um, at the end, when I saw the hospital they took me to, I think I got healthy really quickly because it was kind of a um, pretty basic hospital. Fortunately, I didn't have appendicitis, so I was able to go back and finish it, and it was, it was you know, and yeah. here we are. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and just to return to the cinematography briefly, um, I thought it was quite interesting, so it was Jasper Wolf, was the yes. name, so yeah. um, and I thought it was quite interesting that a lot of the shots almost seem voyeuristic of uh, the kids, so they, mm. they linger quite a lot on below the waist shots, very mm. focused on the body. Mm. Uh, I wondered what you were trying to do with that, was that, were you there something being critical in some way, or what were you trying to explore with those shots? Um, 
No, I, I don't find it all voyeuristic. I think what it was, it was very physical. These are kids that are not only experiencing the physical changes of adolescence, but they're also uh, trained to be soldiers, trained to fight. And the physicality of the spaces and how their bodies react and how their bodies are changing throughout the film um, is a very important part of the story, how nature and the physical body um, speaks to each other. You know, I think that they, they are, a lot of their, what you see and what you feel in the film is related through that physicality that they express as the soldiers that they are. Um, and I think that was important, as I said, the exterior conflict is mirrored in the interior conflict of the bodies and of adolescence and, and, and these type of things. Um, in, in, the, in the mountain, all their bodies are very much covered up because of the cold, so they're all in uniform. But as we progress through the film, um, those layers start to come off. Yeah. And have you got any, any sort of future projects planned? You're going to go back to the jungle to film? Or? Nothing to say right now, but I think it might be an urban project. Okay, something more, something more comfortable to film. Something, maybe. I don't know if comfortable, but different, for surely different. Cool. Yes. Thank you so much for talking to us today. Thank you. And have a lovely rest of the time at the Berlinale. I appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you.